American-made muskets. That's because muskets are military weapons. We're not, not making military weapons in the colonies, really. There's a few crudely made copies of the Brown Best musket, but very few of those. So early on in the war, we're relying a lot on the British musket. You might have heard the nickname Brown Best, which actually that name comes after the war, but they're commonly called the Brown Best. Uh, and later on, uh, 1778, France comes in on our side officially. So that's pretty important because the French, before the war is over, they'll supply almost 200,000 of this one right here. It's called the Charleville musket. Um, there's not much difference between the French and the British muskets. Neither one's really better than the other. Uh, the big difference is the caliber. This one being a 69 caliber, and the British a 75 caliber. And both are pretty big <laughs> by today's standards, especially when we talk about a 75 caliber gun. Now these guns, these muskets, are all smooth bores. Uh, in fact, when you call a gun a musket, musket that kind of refers that it is a smooth bore. And uh, the thing is, they did have rifles back then. Rifling goes way, way back to the late 1400s, so rifling is not any kind of new technology. And rifles are very accurate. Even in 18th century rifles, a pretty accurate gun. This one has an effective range of 100 yards. Now, when I'm speaking of 100 yards, I don't mean hitting your aim target. I'm hitting something, maybe hit something maybe close to what I aimed at. So I was aiming at you, sir, young man. There's a football field separating us, and I shot at you. Would I likely hit you? Probably not. Unless you're extremely yeah. unlucky that day. No, I'm not going to hit you. But I might hit something on this side and something on this side. So it's not a very accurate gun. So which would you ha rather have if you're a soldier, a, rice, a, excuse me, a rifle or a musket? And, uh, hands up for a musket. No hands up for a musket. Well, that's unfortunate because what the most soldiers get? Muskets. Muskets. <laughs> so why does a soldier get this inaccurate musket over a very accurate rifle? Is there any reason for that? Cost. Production. Yeah, there you go. Cost. Production. These are more mass produced. That's going to make them cheaper, almost four times cheaper than a rifle. Rifles are kind of custom made weapons. They're made in small gunsmith shops and small batches. There might not be two rifles exactly alike. They're all little individual weapons, basically. These are all made to a standard. Um, there's no interchangeable parts, really, yet. That won't happen until next century. But they're all made to a standard, so the parts from one will kind of fit the next one, a little bit of filing you can get to fit. Uh, so that'll make them cheaper. Uh, another factor, especially from a soldier standpoint, is speed of loading. You know, a soldier's more interested in rate of fire than he is accuracy. This one, a well-trained soldier is expected to load this musket in 15 seconds, get off four shots in a minute. So does that sound pretty fast to everybody, four shots in a minute? Mm, not much. Well, in, yeah, in the 18th century, that's as fast as you can get. <laughs> Today, that's kind of slow. We can easily have a weapon that gets 15 rounds in 15 seconds. But back then, this is it. Now, an 18th century rifle, remember, pretty accurate, but it's going to take almost a minute to load, maybe over a minute to load. Very, very slow loading weapon. So until we get into the next century, closer to the Civil War period, Rifles are not effective military weapons. So what's the main purpose of a rifle? Hunting, yeah. You're out there hunting, you want that one well-placed shot to bring down the game. It doesn't matter how fast it takes to reload the thing. you got to retract the animal. So you don't worry about speed of load, whereas a soldier is. And that's why you're not going to find bayonet attached to a rifle yet. You don't see rifles having bayonets yet. Because this is kind of useless for hunting, don't you think? You're not going to chase a deer through the woods with a bayonet. No? <laughs> Probably not very effective. Uh, now, the weapons of this period are going to be flintlocks, and uh, how many of you have been to Jamestown Settlement already? I think some of you said you have been. Did you see them fire the musket over there? It's a, if you have, it's a different type. It's called a matchlock. But remember, they're about 170 years in the past from us, so we're not using that old-fashioned matchlock anymore. we got the modern 18th century technology here, flintlock. So flint is a hard stone. I'm going to put a sharp edge on it. When I squeeze the trigger, that flint will hit against a steel hammer. Flint striking steel creates what? A spark. A spark, right, and that'll ignite the gunpowder. That's how it works. It's kind of a chain reaction. But like any chain reaction, does this work every time? No. No, a lot can go wrong with this. And very often you pull the trigger and nothing happens, mainly because it didn't spark. So there's lots that can affect this, especially the wet. These things don't work very well in wet conditions at all. So think about it. you got a weapon that's not very accurate that doesn't go off every time. So sound like the ideal weapon? Well, they'll make good use out of them. It's the tactics that they use with them. And uh, I'm sure he's seen some movies. Anyone ever seen movies of the Revolution? Or in the beginnings of the Civil War, or paintings. How are these soldiers are arranged on the battlefield? Formations. Formations. Lines. Yeah, they call them linear formations. Just another way of saying straight lines. So we've all seen this, right? Does that look like the smartest thing to do? That looks crazy, doesn't it? So why are they doing it? It's uh, fire. It's more rounds going down range. There we go. We want to maximize our firepower. Simply put, you can't use this the way a modern soldier uses his weapon. 
Think if you had soldiers with muskets, instead of being in those tight formations, let's say they're spread across the field. They're hiding behind that building. They're hiding behind fences and trees. They're taking cover. Would any of those guys hit what they're shooting at? Probably not. Probably not. So what do we need to do with the musket is maximize our firepower. Get lots of soldiers shooting at the same time at the same target. If we're doing that, is there a better chance of us hitting the target? Yes. Yeah, remember what our target is? That enemy line. We're not aiming for individual soldiers. We want to put gaps in that line. So imagine this. Imagine you're the enemy line right now. Uh, we're a football field apart, 100 yards apart. Now I decide to shoot a volley. Imagine 100 musket balls heading towards your line right now. How many of those 100 balls would actually hit your line? Any guesstimates? 40, 50, think, think low. <laughs> 20. Think very low. Think 10 or 15 yeah. out of 100. Does that sound like very many? No. What if you're one of those 10 or 15 guys that just got hit though? Oh. That sucks. So that's, that's, yeah, you're pretty unlucky then. So let's say you survived. You're pretty lucky. You survived that volley. You take a look around. What are you going to see? A couple of dead guys. Yeah, some of your buddies who are not so lucky. These are guys you know. You're in the same regiment. You're probably from the same small town. Could have been a good friend. Would that be pretty scary? Yeah. Yeah. How about your musket ball go whizzing by your ear? <laughs> you get the corner of your hat clipped off. You're surrounded by smoke. There's going to be noise, yelling, confusion. Every instinct is telling you to do what? Run. To run. It's a natural human instinct. If enough you run, well, this is the point where you lose the battle. Victory in the 18th century is not inflicting more casualties on the enemy than they inflict on us. Victory is seizing the field. If we push the enemy line off the field, that's victory for us, seizing the battlefield. So the fear factor is huge, getting those guys to run from the field. That's what this thing's all about, this bayonet. Uh, it's not a backup. It's not going to run out of ammunition and have it as a secondary weapon. It's very much a primary weapon. Anytime, I'm going to have a full cartridge box, but if we suspect you're on the verge of running, we're going to do that bayonet charge. You know, our officer, he's a pretty experienced officer. You're over there, you're looking kind of nervous, you're fumbling through your loading. He might decide to do that bayonet charge if we're within range. So, imagine not one, imagine a couple hundred of those pointed right at you. You know what that thing can do to you if it gets close enough. They start advancing. They're going to get closer and closer in every step. Probably yelling at the top of their lungs, too. Who'd want to get out of the way at all those bayonets coming at them? So, it is a fear weapon. It's to drive the enemy from the field. Very few soldiers get killed or injured with those bayonets, though. Do we want to get close enough to really use them? No. Not really. We don't want to get into that hand-to-hand that -hand combat you see in the movies a lot. It looks pretty exciting in the movies, though. Nobody wants that situation. It does happen here at Yorktown at the Redoubts. That's kind of an exception. Basically, you want to push the enemy off the field with this thing. In fact, the British especially place more emphasis on this than on firepower. They say this bayonet is what wins the day. So who wins this type of fighting is a side that's better trained, that's better disciplined, that sticks together. Who does win more of these battles during the war, Americans or British? British. British will win many more, because they're one of the best armies in the world. Well, we do win the war, right? Everybody agree on that? <laughs> With some help from the French. But the British, yeah, one of the best armies in the world. We've got a brand new army. This is the first standing army we've ever had in this country. So it's going to take some time to get up to that level that the British have. And a good uh, the way we'll get to that is through a man named Baron von Steuben. Everybody familiar with the Baron? Mm -hmm. he's, I think he's as famous as he deserves to be, but he was a Prussian and, and a German officer. He knows this European system, and at Valley Forge, his main job is instilling this European professionalism into the Continental Army, which is what Washington wants all along. So anyway, I'll go back on the platform, go through loading and firing of the weapon for you. So I'll fall in, in the battle line. I'll be at the shoulder. I have a weapon on my left arm, and I get the R2 prime and load. I'll drop back to the prime position, looks like this, muzzle, muzzle elevated. The next command is to half cock fire lock. One click is the half cock. Half cock on this musket is a sort of a safety, it disables the trigger, should not go off. You never want to go off half cocked, it's the old expression, that's where that comes from. The next command is handle cartridge. This is my ammunition. A paper tube. Got some gunpowder and a musket ball. And what's the fastest way to open this thing? Bite it. Yeah, bite it. Yeah, I'm gonna bite the end of it just like this. Since both my hands are busy. Prime. A little gunpowder into the priming can. Shut pan. And I'll cast it about, and everything else goes down the barrel. Powder, ball, paper, everything. Draw rammer. Ram down cartridge. Which is everything to the bottom of the barrel, so it's nice and tight. Turn, rammer, I'll come back to the shoulder. Shoulder, fire lock. And when our officer sees us all return to the shoulder, 
he now knows we're all loaded and ready to fire. So the last three commands would be make ready, take aim, and fire. Hey, ready? there will only be one command, prime and load. So you won't get the individual orders this time, just as fast as you can. But remember what the enemy is doing while you're trying to remember all of these steps. It's on fire. Smoky, that would be. <laughs> think, think of a battlefield, maybe several hundred of these muskets, plus the sound of the artillery. This is going to be one noisy, smoky, scary place to be. I'll make sure this is clear. Uh, because I want to get the chance, if anybody wants to just pick this up and get an idea of the weight of it, the fuel, you're welcome to do that. Uh, if you do, a couple safety things I have to tell you because it is a real gun. Is to keep it pointed <laughs> that way. I'm pointed at anyone. And don't have heavy finger on the trigger, don't cock it, and it weighs about 12 pounds. You'll be right with the weight of it too. So uh, you can just stay.